Hello, everyone. I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Though the city can get congested in spots, one place where traffic seems to be especially light, in front of the judge's stand in traffic court. A report showing how few cases the judges actually hear has prompted legislative scrutiny of the size of the local judiciary. We'll examine tonight those who are judging the judges, as well as the Landry administration's new term, new rules for Tulane scholarships, understanding consent decrees, and a look at the ways that the restaurant industry has changed. Stirring, stirring it up for us to our tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. Paula Pandarvis, producer of the upcoming WYS special, Reshaping a Greater New Orleans Criminal Justice, Change by Decree. And Stephanie Grace, columnist, The New Orleans Advocate. First on over to Mike and over to traffic court. You did a report this week about how few trials there are being conducted in traffic court. And also there's some legislation that's moving through the session about a possible merger of municipal traffic. That's correct. These are issues that are, are not brand new. Um, every, anyone who's been to traffic court, in, you know, especially if you've had a ticket, um, you go in, you, uh, if you contest it, you meet with an assistant city attorney, you work out what you're willing to plead to, what you're willing to pay, and you will never see a judge. Uh, and that's been quantified by studies, 99.5% of the time you won't see a judge. And uh, that has led to, in recent years, some talk about downsizing that court. There are four judges. They, three of them serve part-time. They're able to keep private law practices despite the six-figure judge's salary, and they're elected to eight-year terms. So in a city that's hurting for money, that's been looked at as a maybe way to you know, save some costs. So what, what I did was I went in to see, you know, dig a little deeper into just how much work these individual judges are actually doing. And we found that it's, it's a bit lopsided, but sure enough, the general notion that these judges are not doing very much turned out to be true in all of 2013 uh, between the four sections, there were only 85 trials. 59 of them by a single judge, Mark Shea. Mm -hmm. uh, one judge, um, Herbert Cade, had only two trials the entire year. You know, the chief judge, Robert Jones, had 14. So that's barely more than one trial a month. And you say they get six figures, so what, 100000 something? 111000 for the part-time judges. So that's like $50,000 a trial for... Um, something like that. Okay. And I... Do they have other duties? Well, or is that it? not really. Okay. Um, and the judges also have staff, too. Oh, each... Who are part-time staff, Each session comes time, with right? the clerk and the staff, and, you know, it's fully manned court where, amazingly, you know, the clerks are very busy. It's a high volume court as far as the number of tickets. Mm -hmm. People are in there paying fines, you know, daily traffic in and out of that court, except for the judge who rarely has anything to do. Occasional DWI tr uh, will result in a trial. And this has resulted in uh, talk, studies, and this year legislation. Originally pushed by the Landry administration, the legislation was to reduce that court from its current four judges. Well, you know, in the meat grinder, in the back room of, you know, legislative politics, the municipal court, traffic court, and various legislators, in particular, the, the point person on this bill is Walt Leger, mm -hmm. uh, representative of New Orleans, and a compromise was hatched. Uh, originally, the plan was to merge municipal and traffic courts. And interestingly enough, municipal court is now busier than ever. Right. They're getting you know, 40% of cases that used to go to Tulane and Broad State Court, such as uh, marijuana possession, they're now going to municipal court. Mm -hmm. So those judges are actually busier than ever. So the idea was, uh, you know, why don't you slide some of the traffic over to them, expand municipal court, and kind of do away with traffic court. Bringing the total number of judges, eight total, down to six. Well, once it got through the backroom discussions, the legislation ended up being a task force, a study, to bring in the various judges, uh, the heads of you know, the, legisl the legislative committees, as well as the state Supreme Court through the Judicial, Judicial Council, Council to 
determine the right size, as if it hasn't been studied enough. Now, my story that, that ran Monday took it to an even uh, deeper level in that where these judges have precious little to do, and I've talked to the judges, and in particular, uh, when those judges are absent, for legitimate reasons, continuing legal education, illness, vacation, what have mm -hmm. you, they get fill-ins. They have ad hoc judges who sit for them, although sit is used loosely because they almost never take the bench. And in fact, the you know comments from Inspector General Ed Quattrovo was instead of paying one judge to do nothing, we're paying two judges to do nothing. It's because their pay is on top of what the They get paid the judges. $300 yeah. plus rate of a you know single day. And, uh, and I talked to some of those who had served as ad hocs, and sure enough, they say they get called by traffic court and do zero. Um, interestingly enough, there's another wrinkle in that the traffic court judges, uh, they don't just request you know, th through the Supreme Court someone to come and fill the vacancy. They actually have a pool um, of qualified ad hocs that are made up largely of their friends and campaign contributors. They only have to be lawyers. They don't have to be retired judges the way you have in other courts. So they'll basically dial up a friend or someone who's a longtime campaign contributor and say, hey, I'm off Thursday, can you fill in? Right. So as you pointed out, I mean, this is something that has been ongoing now, taking a look at possible merger of municipal traffic since 2011 when the Inspector General issued his report. Right. And you interviewed the Inspector General, and the Inspector General, that's Ed Quattrovo, pulls no punches at all. Yeah, no, and, he meant no words. And how, what he feels about the traffic he, court. No. He's not alone. Uh, the BGR, Bureau of Governmental mm -hmm. Research, uh, did a similar study, came out with a report that showed basically the traffic court could get by with a single judge. And this is using the formula used by the state Supreme Court, using work mm, points right. for the amount of actual workload. Which is an uh, issue in and of itself, that, and which we won't get into right now. I know the juvenile court is also being looked at, too. How, yes. well, how's that going? Now, juvenile court, uh, which has also shown through studies to have uh, you know, more judges than actual work, uh, the bill there, instead of being transformed into more study, uh, got through a legislative committee, passed to reduce that court from six judges down to four. That's being pushed heavily by the Landry administration, okay. and so far, that one's on track. And that's being reported to the House. Um, it, it got yeah. out of the House committee. It has already has passed the Senate. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mike. Correct. All right, over to consent decrees. And Paula Pendarvis and I have been working on a continuing series here at WIS, our Reshaping Greater New Orleans Criminal Justice Series. And uh, Paula has produced an hour that's going to be aired next week, um, taking a look at the consent decrees, the federal consent decrees, jail, and NO. PT consent decrees. What is it? What got us here? And what are you finding out? Well, these consent decrees that the city is facing for at least five years to come with the police and for who knows how long with the jail are really the result of uh, the parties settling to avoid litigation. So this was an easier way out than it may have been had they faced litigation accusing each of the entities, the police and the jail, of violating the Constitution. Um, now they're under these massive to-do lists, hundreds and hundreds of steps each organization has to take to bring their organizations up to standards. And uh, the city has to pay for these things, but um, the people who are in office now are complaining, and they should, but this is generations of deferred maintenance that the city has done, and it just comes to a time where you can't continue to have your entire law enforcement system not operating under the Constitution. And so, um, as you said, it's just a laundry list for both agencies of things that need to be done, and the, the courts are actually, they've appointed monitors to oversee this. Um, particularly, in, and I know you, you really did explore a lot that has happened in our jail, um, what, what are you finding out both from, from the, those who are advocating change and then also from the sheriff? Where does, what does he say? Well, the, the monitors at the jail, um, the federal monitors, um, issued their report in, it was made public in January. It only focused on the time they were appointed in October to December 20th. So it only measured two months um, out of a very long to-do list. The sheriff was only found to be in compliance with six out of the more than 100 things that he had to do. But the monitors 
said that in such a short period that they didn't expect many things to be done. What they were stunned at was that the level of violence, the level of se sexual assault, the level of, um, of, of harm that one is subjected to in the jail has not been improved at all, and that's the number one thing. Also, the issues of having enough security staff and medical staff in that jail. Nothing has happened. The sheriff's attrition rate continues to be enormous, and the inmates are still guarding the jail, and that's just unacceptable. It was described in court hearings in May by the Monitor as mayhem. And the, and the sheriff, well, how does he respond to this? The sheriff um, admits that there needs to be improvement. He blames it on the very old buildings that he's in. He will remind you that the entire place was wiped out by Katrina, and he brought much of it back online. But um, he, he does admit that, that things are going to be better when the new jail comes along. He does not agree that that one is at great risk of harm in the jail. He does take issue with a lot of the things. When we interviewed him, he didn't want to even respond to questions about the expert testimony before Judge Afric, who's handling the consent decree, that in their expert opinions, touring hundreds of jails in all 50 states, this is the worst jail in America. He doesn't want to talk about that. But he does admit that, that there are problems, mainly with facilities and, and with the low pay among his and with staffing. But Paul, the, the new jail, I know, I know you have visited it. I mean, what did you think about it? It's, it's a jail, but it's awesome. I <laughs> mean, it is, it is state of the art, bright, modern, clean. It makes sense. You, um, when you walk into um, a wing, there's, there's two pods on each wing. A wing has, um, I mean, a pod has 30 cells that can each accommodate two people, and most of it, the cells are all around um, the space and it's two floors everything's open uh, they have their own rec area the guards actually will work on the tier on the floor um, unlike now where they're outside the door um, it's you could eat off the floors everything's electronic the um, deputies as they patrol there will be digital proof that they were where they were supposed to be because there's an electronic footprint but um, so but the problem is there are many jails in America that are old, that are constitutional. There's no guarantee that a new building is going to mean that prisoners are kept safe from harm and that they receive basic medical but, care. But does it satisfy some of the requirements of the consent decree? Yes, one of the requirements of the consent decree is uh, sanitation and, and fire codes and all the things that a new building will bring. But the, the most severe points in, this, in the consent decree that need to be addressed are the protection of detained persons from harm, violence, illness, and not just them, but the inmates. I mean, nobody who walks into that jail, according to the people who brought the suit against the sheriff, according to the Justice Department, according to the monitors, there's nobody safe inside that, that jail. And inmate safety is a direct function of the number of guards you have. That's and right, that's right. you know still a huge problem. They're going to have to hire. I think the estimate was four to five hundred new you know right. deputies right. to guard the new the and new the facility. Came up somewhat, but not enough. It came up a couple of dollars an hour. It, it, but but there's a debate over the city thinks it's maybe in the uh, maybe 150 more deputies. The monitor's saying it could be as many as 500. Oh. There's about 473 staff in the jail now. Okay, I've got to wrap up this discussion right now, but you'll be able to find out a whole lot more about what Paula has found out. She's also interviewed family members of, of some individuals who have died in the jail. It's this Thursday, May 15th, 7 p.m., and then we're going to have a web chat afterwards, too, um, at 8 o'clock immediately following, and you go to wyes.org. Uh, and then, of course, we're also looking into the police consent decree, too, in this hour. Thanks a lot, Paula. Over to Stephanie right yes. now, and we had an inauguration this week. The mayor's in his second term. We have some new council members also mm -hmm. and also and you're speaking about the consent decree that's something that the mayor and the council is going to have to deal it's with. It's hanging over everything the mm -hmm. cost of fulfilling these two consent decrees. Um, the mayor actually spent a lot of time even though this week was his inauguration he's been in Baton Rouge trying to get the legislature to allow some tax measures the council to consider some tax measures with some pretty limited success so far um, mixed success mm -hmm. but you know, he, so he uh, was inaugurated Monday morning, the Monday after Jazz Fest, as always, is um, at the Sanger Theater. Um, he made a speech. It was, 
it wasn't a very specific speech, I'll say. It was very thematic. Um, I think partly because it's a second term, we all kind of know what we're getting. And he didn't want to dwell on some of these financial difficulties, although he talked about them. Uh, he didn't announce any new programs or anything. I think with Mitch Landry, maybe unlike Ray Nagin, you know, you kind of, all the, all the pieces are in place before he tells you what he's doing, whereas Ray Nagin would use these speeches sometimes to make some big announcement and then people would get excited and not, nothing would happen. So Mitch is kind of the opposite that way. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was he really talked a lot about um, he talked about equality a lot. Um, you know, during the campaign, he was being attacked by Michael Bagneris, so he was, you know, putting a very positive spin on a lot of what had happened in the city. And of course, a lot of good things have happened. But one of the issues in the campaign was his main challenger, Michael Bagneris, the former judge, you know, talked about how crime was still not nearly as under control as it needs to be, and ha as and how the prosperity that the city is seeing is not necessarily extending to everyone. And what was interesting to me in the speech is Landry really talked about that in a very, I think, emotional way, personal way. Um, he talked about really getting into neighborhoods and, as we were saying before, digging out the, you know, the noxious weeds that lead to this culture of crime. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, you know, the statistic that was floating around in the campaign a lot was this very high percentage of African American males who are unemployed in the city. I, you know, I think I think that's going to be a big focus of his um, going and then, forward. And then also council members. And the council, we have a new council with uh, three out of seven new members. Um, interesting. I think it's going to be a pretty independent council from the mayor, in part because um, he kind of tried to put a ticket together and only had limited success in electing his candidates. So we have, for example, the two leaders of the council, Stacey Head and Jason Williams, new, the new member Jason Williams, the at-large members. He didn't support either of them. Mm -hmm. So they're, I think they're going to be pretty independent. Um, also Nadine Ramsey, who beat Jackie Clarkson in District C. And one thing I'm kind of watching on, on this front is um, Stacey Head, of course, has always been a little bit of the leader of the loyal opposition on the council. And she's taking over the budget committee from Jackie Clarkson, who is a very strong ally of the mayor. And I think she's really going to use that to, I mean, there's going to be serious oversight and a lot of questions and demanding a lot of reports. She's already talking about that. Jason Williams, we got a little bit of a look of what he'll be doing this mm -hmm. week. Um, the council had a meeting, and it started right off with a contentious issue, which was the new development at Holy, Holy Cross. Cross. And Jason Williams was the only one who voted against it, so that was kind of interesting. Right, he showed some independence he there. He did, and, yeah. You know, counter to the district councilman. Exactly, and that's, again, the kind of unwritten rule is right. you follow the district councilman and they follow you. And I thought it was interesting to see Nadine Ramsey follow him, because this was, of course, a, a a development that's going on the riverfront, and she has a lot of riverfront in her yeah. area too. So right. a lot of people are saying, "Well, let's wait and see what happens in her areas." Right. And, and Stephanie, know. could couldn't this be viewed as maybe the most challenging time in Landrew's time at mayor? He does not have the majority of the council, no. and you know the time to pay the bills for both consent decrees. It's due. It's, all yeah. these bills are coming due at once. He's not even talking about things like libraries and health clinics. He's really talking about the consent decrees There's and the, the firefighters' yeah. pension. Right. He's trying really hard to get. The the legislators to allow them to look at some new revenue, and they're yeah. giving him trouble. Yeah, he's so having a hard time getting that that through. Um, the you know, cigarette tax, tax went was, down again. They tried yeah. twice to get it through committee, and they lost by one vote both times. Errol, I know you wanted to say something about Serpass. Yeah, I too. want to talk about, about uh, Chief Serpass. Of course, yeah. his position is not elected, but in a sense, it was uh, a new term for him too, yeah. because uh, police chiefs are, are elected or appointed by the mayor. And uh, Mitch Landrieu stood by Serpass that first time. There were a lot of people mm -hmm. who were out to get him, but he stood behind him, and he's he's still going to be police chief and. And usually police chiefs don't survive eight years of a mayoral term. Every mayor we've had since uh, the charter was approved in 54 has served a full eight years, but usually the police chiefs don't. But I think Surpass has a chance to do that. And really, if that happens and if Landrew stands by him and if, and if the improvements of the consent degree right. all fall into place and if the crime rates uh, 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 keep on declining, he really has a chance to make a major mark right. as a police chief. Like Michael, Pennington, who stayed for eight years. Yeah. So. And, and Michael, what would you think about it? Well, you know, Surpass is very dependent mm -hmm. on some of these budget issues. Sure. You know, they're trying to, you know, fulfill a promise that Landrew made during the campaign to hire 150 new officers. And believe me, surpass all the way down through his rank and file. They're de they're desperate to uh, you know fill a very shorthanded police department. But so far, we haven't even seen the first academy class. They're still trying to beef that first class up to a full 30 
now it's looking like the end of May. So the, but they've just had to deal with the residency issue, and so that's resolved. Well, they, and so they, now they you can take, open that. You know, or at least suspend residency. Mm -hmm. uh, that's you know supposed to help. But now, you know, it's, if it's not one problem, it's another. Now it's low pay. You know, state police mm -hmm. and and other police departments have now passed an OPD on the pay scale. <laughs> So, so we're looking again at the budget issues. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Once again, some real budget challenges. Um, now, Errol, you wanted to talk also about something that is really kind of fun to think about, and that's changes in our restaurant. Yeah, just industry. a little change of pace because uh, there's so much economic activity with the restaurant scene. And I just want to mention what, what I see as three major innovations in the restaurant scene. One is with Vietnamese restaurants. Now, there have been Vietnamese restaurants in New Orleans a long time, but now we're into the second generation. The first generation was places that, that opened on the West Bank or maybe in eastern New Orleans in, a, in an old shopping center in a kind of a, a low-budget operation. Now you're seeing the next generation where the kids went away to college and they got marketing degrees and they got some of grandma's recipes mm -hmm. in their starting places as a place uh, called Namiz on, on Carrollton, which is an example of that. And uh, they have their liquor licenses, they have bars, they have white tablecloth. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing the next generation of it. But you also see places like there's a place called Mofo, which serves Vietnamese food. Those people aren't even Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And so you have a generation of New Orleanians who are growing up on that food and who have learned the food and you know, know about the vegetables, learn about the techniques. And so Vietnamese cuisine is having a big influence on, on New Orleans cuisine. Uh, the other thing is breakfast places, that there's mm -hmm. more and more of those, uh, of those places. Uh, a restaurant called the Ruby Slipper, which is uh, near Mandina, is open, and I think that it wasn't the first place to do like really specialized breakfast, but it has been a huge success, and more and more of those sort of places are opening. But the other sort of interesting thing is the, uh, the so-called pop-ups. And these are little places that started maybe in a bar, or most often it's in a bar, or sometimes in another restaurant where some guy had some kind of specialty. Maybe he made pizza, maybe he did barbecue. Started off in that place, had a, a small business, in some cases developed a following, and then started a restaurant on, on their own. There's a place on, um, on, on, on Carrollton in, in Canal called Milkfish, which is actually a Philippine restaurant that started as a, as, as, as a pop-up. There's, there's several barbecue places that have started. There's a place uptown called Sandwich, in which a guy gets really full course specialty <coughs> meals and put them between two slices of bread and calls it uh, a sandwich. But what's interesting about these places, it just so happens that the night that Milkfish opened, which was that Thursday night before Easter, I was in the neighborhood, and so we went there thinking it would be empty and it was packed. And I asked the guy, and, and they hadn't done any publicity. Well, you see, because these places are pop-ups, they have a, a big social media following. Uh, and so the word spreads, and so these places have, have their following. And so it, it's a new way of doing businesses where, where, in effect, these places are apprenticing at one spot, developing a, a following, open up a new spot, and already have a built-in clientele. And I think that's going to help the restaurant industry expand even further and give more people an opportunity to get into it. And, you know, it also plays into the sort of the younger entrepreneurial crowd. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, it's almost hipper <laughs> to be discovered through social media than some traditional, you know, advertising. And the guy, and the guy who owns Milkfish, again, this started off as a pop-up. He told me that there's going to be one night a week that they're closed. I think it's going to be Wednesday. And for that one night, that they're going to allow a pop-up uh -huh. there. So you're seeing <laughs> the next generation of pop-ups uh, to go in there. So no need to go hungry. There are a lot of, a lot of choices out there. And a lot of new activity uh, happening. So. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Mike, Tulane Scholarships, there's some changes happening in the legislature, maybe. It still has to go for Yeah, that's an final interesting post. one. Now, this you know, followed very directly on a series of stories that I did along with our partners at the New Orleans Advocate, <clears throat> Gordon Russell in particular, showing that those Tulane legislative scholarships, the scholarships that each and every legislator gets to give to a worthy student of his or her choice, uh, had the potential, and in fact, we exposed some abuses with scholarships going to insiders, the children of elected officials, right. campaign contributors. Right. So uh, immediately, uh, bills popped up in both the House side and the Senate side to reform, at least some modest reform measures. Uh, interestingly, on the House side, it was by w one of those um, representatives that we exposed, Harold Ritchie, who gave a scholarship to the son of the powerful St. Tammany District Attorney, Walter Reed. His bill got killed and, and did not pass the House. So However, quickly, if you could sort of tell us what right. is the bill that is living. So now, on the Senate side, 
Senator Clayter got that bill through the Senate. So now they're at a crossroads. Will the Senate bill get adopted by the House, and we will see some real reform in that scholarship program. And what kind of changes program. then? What, what are they calling uh, for? To prohibit uh, scholarships from going to the children of elected officials, to better advertise the program. Um, there was, you know, the prohibition on campaign contributions. That got scrapped on bo from both bills, so you can still give camp campaign contributors children scholarship. All right, and so when does that go, where does that go next? Well, it goes again, it now has to um, be a adopted on the House calendar. Okay. And that's up to the House leadership. Now, whether they're going to swallow Clater's bill, make some changes to it, that usually happens in a mysterious fashion. But at some point, we'll look to see it pop up on the calendar and know that it's, right, it's still so alive. We, we still have some time in the legislature yet, leg this legislative session. All right, looking ahead, that's what it's time for now. The group, the Forberg Marity Improvement Association, is having a, a home tour next Sunday the 18th. What's unusual about it is that the name of the tour is Won't You Be and Be My Neighbor? And what they want to emphasize is the places in their area that are legal B&Bs because they also want to emphasize all the illegal B&Bs. And the argument they're making is that the legal places are the ones that have to pay hotel and motel taxes. They have to have live-in residence. Meanwhile, you have like, these other people that don't have live-in residence that aren't paying taxes, and they just don't play by the rules. And so they're trying to emphasize the two sides uh, uh, in, in the Marini area. All right. Mike? Yeah, sticking to the topic of downsizing of judges, we have a juvenile court judge who's actually facing criminal charges, Yolanda King, for filing a false report misstating her residence on her camp on her um, qualification papers and we finally got a uh, ad hoc judge appointed to that case judge michael kirby the retired judge from plaquemines parish in the fourth circuit so now that case can go forward and it'll be very interesting to see how that unfolds she's now back on the bench in juvenile court while you know facing this criminal okay. charge all right thanks paula I want to uh, remind everybody to watch next thursday night reshaping a greater new orleans criminal justice Change by Decree, where you can find out much more about the jail and police consent decrees and also the new effort to try to reduce mass incarceration statewide. All right, Paula. Thanks, okay. Stephanie. And it's graduation season, which means graduation speech season. And we have a couple interesting ones coming up this weekend. Michelle Obama will be speaking to graduates at Dillard tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mary Landry is speaking at Southern. And one that's particularly interesting, Bobby Jindal's going to Virginia to speak at Liberty University. This is the university founded by Jerry Falwell. It's a must stop for anybody hoping to um, pursue the Republican nomination, if that's what he wants to do. Um, he's going to talk a lot about his personal faith and what he sees, or what he describes as the war on faith okay. in this country. It's going to be very political and personal. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.